It's a golden fall morning in the sleepy lakeside town of Sunapee, New Hampshire. This is about the last place I'd expect to find one of the biggest rock stars on our planet. Before he became music legend Steven Tyler, he was Steven Tallarico, a skinny, rambunctious boy who spent every summer of his childhood here, helping his parents manage a handful of vacation cabins they rented to tourists. In his best-selling memoir, Does the Noise in My Head Bother You?, Stephen says it was here in his beloved Sunapee, under these trees and on this water where his spirit was born. What a perfect setting for our surprising and open-hearted conversation. Pretty amazing. Oh, this must be the harbor. Don't roll yet, but we'll see. I will give her the cue. Oh. Howdy! Howdy! <laughs> Howdy! I'm my house! I brought flowers from my house to your house. Oh my god. I cut these myself yesterday in my garden oh. to bring to you. Yes. Oh yeah, so you take one. I love this place. Right? I do. I knew you would. I love this place. Okay. I love this place. It's a, it's a little nook. It's a little nook. Mm -hmm. I can't believe it is so, it is so unrockstar like I gotta <laughs> tell you. That's the other side of it. <laughs> it's the other side of it. We're gonna find you. out about that. We're gonna find out about mm. that side of you. Well, we can put these down someplace. We'll okay, put them in the house. Them right okay, over good. Here. Let's put them down. Beautiful. Good. How's that? Beautiful. Well, tell me about this place. Is this, you know, I read your book, uh -huh. and as I'm driving, I went, there's the harbor! <laughs> Actually, the harbor's smaller than I imagined mm -hmm. from the way you described mm -hmm. it in, in the book. Very country, very small. Very country, very small. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is where you're... That's, that's why, you yeah. know? That's why, that's why all of this is like, it's a place that you can grab onto. Uh -huh. And there's so much God here, and so much life on life's terms here. Uh -huh. This isn't where you grew up, because where you grew up actually is it like where they like little cottages. That's the way you describe yeah, it in the book. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then you bought this. And then I bought this. Yeah. yeah. I would drive by and I'd look down and I'd see down, and it was an enclave and it uh -huh. was a little nest. And this house was there, but it never looked like this. And but the dock was, and the, the trees were, and especially the rocks. I'm so glad I'm to so be so here. Glad you're Thank here. you for letting me yeah. come here. You know, it's really special when somebody lets you inside the space that. Mm -hmm really is private and belongs mm. to them in a, in, a, in a way that people don't normally see you. I think mm. that's amazing. Yeah. This is that. so calming. How can you... <laughs> you know, I wake up every morning, mm -hmm. and I walk down over here like that, and I go mm. up those stairs, and I jump right off the top of that into the water, mm -hmm. and that's my good morning plunge. Really? Really? <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah. I want to go over and look at it's, it. It feels like a meditative space, just just mm. just because it is. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it feels mm -hmm. like the water is so soothing. Nice. Right. So what is this? This house is. This is a boat house. Boat house. Mm -hmm. And that's your main house. Oh, so how long have you had the house, Stephen? God, twenty six years. Wow. Mm hmm. And you know, it's one of those places that because you're on tour, we never really go anywhere. We're always everywhere else. You know. Uh huh. Um, so, so this is always that winter place that we'd come up to and, you know, have somebody shovel out the snow and come down and light a fire. Yeah, but in winter, nobody's here. I remember in the book you described standing at the harbor once when you were like a kid and mm. nobody was there. Nobody. Because this is deserted in winter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And everybody that says, it's deserted now, listen. You know, usually boats are going up and down and sailboats and yeah. people and kids laughing, but, uh, you know, and I was never, I never experienced that when people left, and I got separation anxiety. I woke up one morning, and I realized that the sidewalks were rolled up. 
Ah, because everybody's and, gone. Yeah, and yeah. I think I was 17. Yeah. And I thought about being a man. And what am I going to do? I have to get a job oh. and sustain, you know, this thing called life. I'd never put it together. It was like, ah! But I love, too, when you were saying that, you know, everybody else was going off to be a man. People in high school were going off to be, become a man, to do the man thing. But you weren't, you weren't thinking about that at all. No. I had such a beautiful home life with her. Aunt Phyllis and Uncle Ernie and... Uh, Linda. Linda, she's, she's here. And, uh, and your you dad. Know. I'm so oh, sorry yeah. to hear about your dad. But 95, come mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. 95. Yeah. Stephen's father, Victor Tallarico, passed away just days before I arrived. Victor was a professional pianist. Like his only son, Victor devoted his entire life to music. Stephen and his sister Linda buried their father next to their mother, Susan, here in Sunapee. We were all in the room with him when he took his last breath. Uh, what was, was that just like? last week. What was that like? Oh, I heard him make a noise and it was like... You know, it's so hard to, to explain. It was such a loss. We were all sitting there and crying up a storm. And, you know, it was just for every breath he took, he took three breaths. And then he, he'd hold it for 30 seconds. And then take three breaths again. And then and then it would be held again for 45 seconds. And then it was the last one. It was a whole hour of that. So it was... So for every breath you're holding, wondering, is this going to be the last one? It's going to be the last. And... I, you know, I got to sleep with him the night before and hold his hand and talk to him and everything, and it was just, you know, I've never done that before. I've been told that <clears throat> to be with somebody when they die is a, one of the most important things you can do on the planet mm -hmm. to help them out. Well, that's what I've heard, I've so heard that's that what too. I wanted to know. Was it that way for you? Did it feel that way? It felt that way. I, it was a piece of me that didn't want to go through all that, mm -hmm. didn't want to hear all that. And there was a piece of me that knew that I needed to be there with Dad. And, and then when I, I, every second was, it changed. I realized the family was with me, 12 people. And then I was alone with him like this, listening to my daddy take his last breath. And it was just so, you know, it was that. Now I can, I can intellectualize about it, but it was just pure feeling, pure emotion that Daddy's going right now. Mm. It was so, so hard. What was the last thing you said to him? I love you, Dad. The last thing I said, I heard him take it. He held his breath for 45 seconds. Mm -hmm. And when it got to 45 seconds, I said, I was like so, you know. <laughs> and I went, Mom, here comes Daddy. And then I thought, he took another breath again. I thought, oh, jeez, did I? Because mm. Mom passed away two mm -hmm. years ago. And mm -hmm. I just said, Mom, Daddy's coming to you. And, you know, I tried to be that spiritual guy, mm -hmm. but that my emotions took over way way too much I and mean, i love my daddy so much I, mean, I wonder what it'd be like when your mommy and dad are gone like i've heard people who say when they've lost their parents do you feel like you've lost your anchor um yes and no because i afforded myself the last a year wherever i was i was able to come leave it and and just stop on a dime people were lending me their planes and come see dad so i i got to re-up my relationship with him again and he was there but not one day he'd be playing the piano because he was a classical pianist. And the next day, uh, you know, he wasn't there at all. And I just, every time I think of Dad, I thank God of this whole last year that I got a chance to be close to him. That's the part. Yeah. Things I never thought about. That's but... what matters. Did you get a chance to say everything you wanted to say? Yeah. 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 Yep. Feel everything you wanted to feel? Yeah. Yeah. Yep, yep. My man is your children. I, I don't know of another per who has taken more drugs than you. May I say, I am surprised you're still alive. On a gorgeous fall day, I traveled to New Hampshire to a cozy 85-year-old cabin tucked away from the spotlight on the beautiful waters of Lake Sunapee. This is where I got a unique look inside the seldom seen private life of Steven Tyler, rock and roll icon. And now, a big breath of fresh air on American Idol. This, uh, I could see where you could, why right. you come home to this, right? Yep, I'll see. And swim out to these rocks and just uh. sit there. Mm -hmm. This has been 
a beautiful year, except for the bittersweet mm -hmm. of having the family there because my dad passed. Mm -hmm. You know, Liv said, you know, I've, I've never been with, with my sisters and brothers when my mom passed upstairs. She said that. And, you know, imagine that that's, we live these kind of lives, you and I, that we're in the tail of a comet, right? And when we stop and we really do feel a family, I feel bad I do what I do. I feel bad I left, you know, Mia and my ex, my first wife here. I left him here, I abandoned him. I was on drugs, but also went on tour. And then I'd come back here and think, oh my God. Why did I leave? Oh. You know? Let's go in time. Why did I ever leave? It's all okay. It is, isn't it? It's really all okay. Oh yeah. Nice. Boy, this looks like a family lives here. <laughs> this is like a family yeah, yeah. lives here. A uh, rock star family, but uh -huh. family, yeah. Uh-huh. We just added leopard. that. Yeah. Just added the leopard thing? Mm-hmm. We just did. It just was, did. It was, it was not so good before that. Really? It looks good now. <laughs> looks good, looks now. good now. It was here at Lake Sunapee where one of the greatest rock anthems of all time was first imagined. Stephen was only 17 when he composed the melody for Dream On in 1973. The song catapulted Aerosmith into superstardom. It went on to become a touchtone song for an entire generation. Almost 40 years after its release, Dream On still brings down the house at every Aerosmith concert. This piano this is right cool. here? Yeah, this I, piano. I, when we van first started, I, I bought one of those. If Remember you read in the book about me um, finding a suitcase by the side, and I yep. opened the suitcase, it was full of dirty rocks, an uh, ounce of marijuana, yeah, and, and, and 1800 bucks. I bought that. That's what you did? Some guy up here, we stopped, that's why it's so magical up here. We stopped at the gas station, and I says, I have your old piano. He says, excuse me? He goes, yeah, I have the piano that you wrote Dream On on. It says Aerosmith on the top. And I went, well, where is it? And I went over and looked, and he wound up giving it to me because it guilted him to death. That's it. He didn't make you pay thousands and thousands of dollars no, to get it back? No, it was back. a really that nice... Good, that's a good guy. Local, that is country a good guy. boy. That is a good guy. <clears throat> he gave it to me, and I, I turned it on. It's the same sound. After how many years, though? Well, 40. <sighs> 1972, three. That is amazing. Mm-hmm. That is a... That, There's the magic. There's the magic. There's the magic. And how but, long has this piano been here? This my dad gave me this. It's a, it's a super long. It's eight-footer. So it's got phenomenal bass and... Uh, did he, he used to play here all the time? Yeah, he played here, yeah. He always wanted the tune before he came in, and uh, he was playing here five months ago, four really? months ago, yeah. Really? Yep. But he wasn't playing this. He okay. wasn't playing this. My manager told me No bros in the house No bros in the house I will finish that. <laughs> you will finish it. Oprah's in the house. Oh, yeah. Oprah in the house. Oprah's Woo! in the house. All right, let's go sit down. Okay. Thanks for letting me in your house. Oh, this yeah. is so cozy, so warm. On a cold, I would love this on a cold, rainy day. Mm -hmm. Right? Fireplace going. Yeah. Yeah, I'd be outside all the, for all the sunny days. Mm -hmm. and, oh, God. and the fireplace goes a little about yeah. the whole wall. Yep. Yep. Love, yep. Love, love, love. Love, love, love. All right. I guess this is my chair. Mm -hmm. We're going to sit down. We're going to reset and have the glam squad come in. Make sure. Okay. Stop we're getting in the back. Wait. So can we start? You're, we're, we're rolling. You gotta okay, tell me we're about rolling. This. Yeah. You got to tell me about this. What are we rolling? You're we're, rolling. You're rolling. Oh, good. Do you, under, you, you understand. This is what I love about you. You understand, ultimately, that... We are all just transmitting energy. Mm -hmm. That you are a uh, electromagnetic field. You talk a lot about that yeah. in the book. Mm -hmm. So what is it when you walk into a room, do you think the energy charge, what is that energy charge that you're you're emitting? I think it's be, it's being willing to be a receptor. Mm -hmm. Like I I, when I look at somebody, I can. I have a whole problem today with judging. I'm not supposed to judge, but wh however, when I look into people's eyes, 
I feel something from them. It's an unspoken thing. I can feel their energy and I get something and I understand where they're coming from and all kinds of stuff before they even speak, but I think it's because I'm open. Mm -hmm. I think it has to do with us being willing, not to mention you're a magical being. I feel it from mm -hmm. you already. I think before you were Oprah and got all famous, I think I would have sensed that from your being. It's your personality. Not everybody's born like that with it. But you went and ran with it. Yeah. And so did I. Let's talk about running with it when you were growing up around here. Was there a part of you that sensed that this would be a place to come home to, but this would not be your life? Definitely. I first grew up here mm -hmm. and had all those feelings about the water and the smell. I went out in a canoe before and I was paddling in by myself and the smell off the lake. And this is the true Stephen. Mm -hmm. it, that is it. Uh, looking for a little beach here and I, that's why I bought this property. There's like, mm -hmm. you know, 15 feet of beach and the feeling in the woods. And so then I left at 18, 19 to, to rock and roll out mm -hmm. and wound up taking so many drugs that alter your stuff that, you know, I thought I was taking this with me because mm -hmm. every time I smoked a joint, I felt like I was up on the chairlift of Mount Sunapee. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Every time I would do whatever other drug, I felt like I was underwater here, uh, you know, look, you know, with the fish and all this. I was trying to re recreate it. So when I come back here, I felt it again. And it was such a pull because by then i had been addicted to the dark side or the the light side. May I say, I am surprised you're still alive. Mm -hmm. I am just, you know, mm -hmm. when I read your book, I, I, I don't know of another per who has taken more drugs, has mm -hmm. done more stuff, mm -hmm. has lived outside of yourself more than you. You know, it used to be cool to hear that. Now it kind of hurts. It does? A little bit. I'm going to have a little shame about, you know, not being as wide-eyed open like this while that was going on, mm -hmm. like during the 70s. And by the time the 80s hit, I was just full-blown doing stuff that... Are you surprised you're alive? Yeah. Yeah, I am. Yeah. I used to hate people that said, this last run, I was on a nighttime sleeping drug and, uh, and uh, drugs for my feet because of the operations I had because mm -hmm. I have to walk around and it hurts to walk. So I was on those drugs and, and uh, just, just that little bit, it makes you like this. Whereas you and I are peripheral visionaries. Mm -hmm. And damn it, what was I doing this for? Mm -hmm. Was it more comfortable? Heroin, you know, is like putting, it's like I've got a chinchilla. It's like putting a, co co a coat on, yeah. a cloak of fur. Heroin, you make you just feel so comfortable in a world of doing Madison Square Garden, coming off stage and getting pecked to death like chickens. It's a comfort to go sniff a little something and go somewhere. And so I just rode that, that beast, but this last run when I was like falling asleep here in the pit, you know, um, the pit being over the there. The pit being right there. Yeah. They would say, you know, you're going to kill yourself. You know, you're going to be dead tomorrow. And I thought, what? Just fell asleep. This is what I normally do. So it's an adventure. You know what? The drugs for me was falling down the rabbit hole. I know Alice. You know yeah. Alice. Oh, yeah. We had an affair for a long time. What did drugs do for you that fame and money and adoration and all that comes with being a rock star could not? Were you a good person to be married to? lived the quintessential hard rockin' life. He claims to have smoked, snorted, or shot up more than $20 million worth of drugs. He's been through eight rehab facilities, most recently two years ago. What did drugs do for you that fame and money and adoration and all that comes with being a rock star could not? What did drugs do? I think made me feel like a rock star before I was one. Mm -hmm because I thought that that's what rock stars did. Did you, you always know? know you were going to be a rock star? Yeah. Yeah, I told my mom, and as I put in the book, yeah. I said, Mom, get some bars on the window. I mean, how lofty is that? But, um, yeah, you used no, to tell her, drunk. put bars on the window because the fans are going to be coming yeah. in. And she would say, yeah? Yeah. Oh, she would say, OK, right. And so I just, I lived in that world. I, you know, and the funny thing is, is everything I've ever thought of, I've imagined, I've done. 
Really? I've imagined doing this with you before. Really? Because it was something I wanted to do. I like you. I loved your show. I loved who you were. I knew you. I knew that this was going to be really comfortable for me. And I knew that I wanted to get something out more than just singing. Before, because remember, I'm a drug addict alcoholic. I know that there's another album in me. I think there may be another high. I don't know whether I'll survive it. Mm -hmm. I hope not. Mm -hmm. I'm so locked and loaded right now in AA and, mm -hmm. and in my program, my 12-step program, that I'm good with it. But yeah, I always... But that doesn't mean you will never get high again. No, it doesn't. That's the thing. I know I won't, but it doesn't mean I won't. So I have to be careful about that. So when you say I know you won't, that means you believe you want, you think you won't, you don't want to. Well, I've got what that means is right now I've set myself up with sponsors. I've got a uh, 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 bunch of great people in my life that are sober as well that have been to the dark side, mm -hmm. lived on the dark side of the moon, and I love them. Mm -hmm. I've got a great sponsor in L.A. I got sponsor in Boston, mm -hmm. and I go to meetings, and I I keep it real, and I don't want to go back there, or I'll lose it all. What's the lowest you've been? 79, 81, 82. 79, 81, 82. Yeah, those years. Yeah. I was walking the streets of New York, looking for heroin on Ninth Avenue, and in between stuff had happened so much, you know, um, yeah. Even as much many drugs as you've been on and eight times in rehab, you still don't think drugs are all bad? Well, no, they can't be. I mean... You know, uh, I took, uh, I'm on Neurontin now for my feet. If I wasn't, I would be losing it because mm -hmm. it's so painful, mm -hmm. uh, that Morton's neuroma. And why are your feet so bad? Because of wearing, from, from, I think from from dancing around dancing stage. on stage all those years. Yeah, I have no toes on that. Mm -hmm. I just have a big fat toe. Mm -hmm. They're all squished in underneath, you know, and yes. yeah, then my toes are all like this. They took the nerves out of here and here. So after that operation, I simply, this was, this was 2002, three. Mm -hmm. uh, after that operation, uh, I was on so many drugs and I didn't give them to someone else to hold. Remember, I'm a drug addict. So mm -hmm. next thing you know, I'm in bed like this and I start snorting it. And, and I got really bummed out and ashamed. Stephen was sober for 12 years when a string of medical and personal issues brought him back to bad habits. Stephen began suffering the effects of Morton's neuroma. It's a painful nerve condition in his feet. He had surgery but feared he'd never be able to dance on stage again. While he recovered, the ban took a year off. For years, Stephen had been infected with hepatitis C. He began undergoing a painful year-long treatment regimen, which cured the illness but left him weakened and sick. As he rehabilitated, another blow. He and his wife of 17 years, Teresa Barrick, split. So that was 2002, um, I had hepatitis C, and you know, you shoot the interferon, mm -hmm. and I took a lot of more pills than I was supposed to. And the band was taking a year off, and I said, okay, I'll do it. And I started shooting. To treat your hepatitis C. To treat my hepatitis C. Yes. Because I'm the kind of guy that jumps in with both feet. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. So I did. And three months in, uh, I got into a row with my wife. She left me. And, and I was there with the kids alone. Uh, and I was diagnosed with a brain tumor. And I had another boy problem. And I went, wait, what? What? I might not be sexually active anymore. And I have a tumor. I mean, I was... <laughs> I was just, every night I had to straighten up and go and sleep with the kids and at night after they came back from the nanny and just mm -hmm. pretend to be not, right? And then my mom passed. You know, there was just a lot of things. Both dogs died. The kids went, to, went away to college. Uh, this was just in the last year, mm -hmm. so it was a nine-year run mm -hmm. of things happening. But I wasn't going to meetings and point blank, I'm just, I'm that good a drug addict. Mm -hmm. I have to always remember there's a 500 pound gorilla waiting in the parking lot for me. Mm -hmm. Now, it feels weird saying that after two years because they do have it under control now, mm -hmm. but I have to always remember that. I have to always remember that. Always, always, always. And you know, I've always said of all the things I ever lost, I miss my mind the most. It's one of those funny <laughs> things. Yeah. How do you do that night after night, year after year for 40 years and not be completely controlled by your ego?
Tell me what that's like when you walk out and there are 20,000, 30,000 It's like people. being on drugs. It's another world. Uh -huh. There's really no difference, except, you know, you can't stop that feeling. That's the one thing I hate about drugs is you take it, you're on it. Mm -hmm. And when you take it a lot, you just, you think that being on it all the time is where it's at. It's not. It's about feeling experiences like walking to this house or when I first saw you, mm -hmm. or going out in the morning and watching the sunrise or sunset in Maui. Mm -hmm. Those are the experiences. And then you go to bed and you watch TV, you see a movie. It's those experiences. You can never keep it in a red line. What you say in the book is, is that the drugs take away the peripheral vision. They do. Makes you myopic. Makes you myopic. Okay, so what's the difference between walking out on the stage with 30,000 people on drugs and off drugs? On drugs, can you feel them? Or do you feel them differently? When I got sober, I asked myself, why did I even take them on stage? It was just a way of life. You know, I wasn't born this. Remember, I survived the 60s and 70s. Yep. If you didn't take LSD in high school, you weren't cool. And we took it. It was so great. We took acid and walked up to the top of Mount Sinope. Walked. S tasted the wind when it blew. Tasted. And drank a pine tree. You drank it. You, sw you, dr it, you could taste the water before you looked at a brook. Oh, yeah, the green smell off the rolling hills, you tasted it. Uh, oh, yeah, some drugs are the greatest. It's just, it's, it's like now I can look at a field full of wildflowers mm -hmm. and smell it and taste it just as well. You don't need that, but it was fun back then, and that's what I did. Mm -hmm. Jimi Hendrix, excuse me while I kiss the sky. You can't kiss the sky, but... You know, it's that. I wanted to taste everything and see it. But, but I you're get... talking about all of these experiences that drugs gave you. Yeah. yeah. But I can do that now with a song. You can. I can get so inside of I don't want to miss a thing. When the, we're in the throes of an emotion, mm -hmm. and I'm singing to them, I don't want to miss a thing, and they're singing the words back like this. Mm -hmm. Every word, every nuance. I don't want to kiss one night. I don't want to kiss one kiss. I just want to be with you right here with you, just like this. I just want to... And they're singing it back to me full on. They're, it's like making love. Mm. What does that contact feel like? You were saying it feels like making love mm -hmm. when you and the audience are mm -hmm. like this. When you're singing a song, it's a, it's a complete a song. Is lyrics have been worked out. They've been crafted in such a way to mean so much. There's the first verse to set you up. I could lie awake just to hear you breathing. Yeah. Watch you smile while you're sleeping, so far away and dreaming. I get, it's this complete setup too. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to miss a thing. Mm. It's a complete, full sentence. It's a lifetime in song, if the melody's just right. Tell me this, though. How do you do that night after night, year after year, for 40 years, and not be completely controlled by your ego? How does one live a life where you are idolized? You are an American idol. And hold on to yourself. I just I don't buy into that lofty... Um, I can't live off the ego. When it comes to things like that, who do, you, who do I think I am? It's like a gift to me that I get to be that guy on stage. It's not something I earn because I'm that great. It's a gift that I've made contact with them. Mm -hmm. That's an honor. So my ego, it's a gift. When they came, it, that was the gift, that anyone showed up at all. Mm -hmm. So it's not me. Uh, it, it, I also know at any moment I could sing a song and it could be the end of my career. Mm -hmm. But do you feel like a rock star? I mean, I have to say, I mean, I have a wonderful life. I love my life. But I would have to say that in the world of you know, dream things, to be on stage. I was, I had Tina, Tina Turner on the show years ago and we did a song together on stage um, in Los Angeles. And just looking out at that crowd and seeing the people, I thought, well, isn't this this is an amazing thing to have happen to you, that people are singing the words to your songs and they're literally, you know, holding you in some kind of reverence. Well, imagine being in a room full of 20,000 people and they're singing that song and they're singing that chorus, the whole place together. You've gotten everyone on the same page for a few seconds. Mm -hmm.
What a miracle that is. Mm -hmm. That's a beyond miracle. And I feel it. Where did the songs come from? Well, that one came from Diane Warren. Excuse me. <laughs> I love Diane. Um, I do too. But like Sweet Emotion, Tom was playing do 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 well, the gift my father gave me playing Bach and Beethoven on the piano, I, I would see that piano, yeah. but I grew up under it. Mm -hmm. From six mm -hmm. months to eight months on the couch, till I could crawl. And I'd go under there and feel very comforting when Dad played Bach and Brahms and Debussy. Boom, da ba boom, boom, da da da, ba ba boom, ba, da ba 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 that, it sounds like this looks. Mm -hmm. This lake and the water. Oh, da, da, da. See the water's moving this way. Mm -hmm. Oh, and there's the trees and boathouses, and maybe the birds that fly across. It's all a complete sentence. So I, I learned that living under the piano and hearing that. So I think they used to say, the guy that did the David, Michelangelo, would say, Yes. It, it was always there. The rock was in the way. I just chiseled the rock away. The melody's there. I've learned it from my dad, the gift, and it's just waiting, it's like a hanger, and I'm waiting, or a hat, I'm waiting for the just right hat rack to come along, and I know how to fling my hat right onto it. I always wondered, okay, if you're the lead singer of the band, doesn't the rest of the band members sometimes get pissed off with you, or jealous? This season on Oprah's Next Chapter. Your world is her stage. I told you it was coming. So this is Haiti. Do you have dreams for your daughter and your son? More of the in-depth interviews you love. Can you believe you grew up in the back of a gas station and you're here? President of the United States. Was that not attractive to you? Would you say that everybody is embraced in your church? Have you ever doubted your faith? Tell me how you know what you know. Would you say this is a place that Star Wars built? I think a lot's riding on it. Do you feel that too? An unparalleled access into lifestyles you've never seen. So what we're seeing, nobody's filmed this before. Why did you all agree to talk today? Nobody at this table has ever watched television. We're not sitting on the Oprah Winfrey Show in those chairs anymore, people. Oprah's next chapter, all new Sundays, 9, 8 central, only on OWN. Aerosmith is the best-selling American rock and roll band in history. Over the past five decades, addiction and internal conflict have threatened to tear their group apart. But this moment in 2009 nearly destroyed Aerosmith for good. In the middle of a performance in South Dakota, Stephen fell eight feet off the stage, leaving him with a broken shoulder. He says no one in the band visited him in the hospital, which upsets him to this day. In his book, Stephen says his band was plagued by something he calls the other LSD, lead singer disorder. American Idol. Lead singer disorder. <laughs> we didn't really talk about, did we finish? We didn't finish that. You guys changed the tape. Lead singer disorder. I never thought of it, but I've always, yes, I did. I, yes, I do want to, I, I want to finish lead singer. Sean, we're going to finish LSD. Let's talk about LSD. Yes. Lead singer. <laughs> Isn't that the funniest? Yeah. I but you know, when I was reading that, I was thinking, well, yeah, of course. I always wondered, okay, if you're the lead singer of the band, doesn't the rest of the band members sometimes get pissed off with you or jealous or want to know how come my name isn't up there or want to know? Doesn't that happen? It happens hugely so. Um, you're the only person I've ever heard talk about it. Because I guess it's an unspoken thing. It is. They're afraid to. I'll yeah. tell you flat out. It, 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 I put myself in their position. You know, when someone comes up and asks for my autograph, because I'm the big lip singer of the band, uh -huh. you know, of Aerosmith, uh -huh. and they don't ask my drummer, I'm so hurt. You are. I am so hurt. So I'll can say, you imagine I'll say hey, what about him? Yeah. I said, you know, but the truth is, is that they, they're they not as well seen. They're not as, that the I'm not even an A personality. I'm so beyond that. Yeah, so, so when, so because of that personality that I am, that I put that out on this dancing bear, and all that stuff, I'm the face that they recognize, and it hurts them.
And in that, I don't think these, I don't think those guys in the band have really looked at that and said, you know what? I'm just, I'm jealous. Let's call a spade a spade. You know, I was jealous of Joe when he was, girls would come up to him when we first started out. Mm -hmm. I was. So I get it. Every lead singer gets it from the rest of the guys. Let's talk about forgiveness then. So does it come with you forgiving and them also forgiving? Let's talk about forgiveness and the role that it's played in your life. It's one of the things now that I've learned is forgiveness is the answer to everything. It's the answer to every problem anyone has. Just, and it's not, some people say, just let it go, Oprah. Let it go. <laughs> it's, and you, can't, you go, I can't do that. But it's, if someone says, you know what? What if you forgave them? Just do it. Try this. Try forgive them. Say, I forgive you. And then say, I forgive myself for what I did to you, too. But I forgive you for what you did to me. And, and I just want to love you. I know it sounds really, you know, or touchy-feely or uh -huh. uh, stupid, too nice, almost, right? But it's really the answer to everything, forgiveness. Uh, when I left Betty Ford after falling off the stage and with all the anger I had against those guys, and boy, did I have some anger. But the anger wasn't just about falling off the stage. No, it was angry that they didn't come to the hospital and go, what's wrong with you? Even that would have been fun. I would have been felt so uh, healing if they went, what's wrong with you, man? You, you ruined the tour, man. I know you probably used, and, you know, you all right, man? And they said, well, we didn't come because your manager said to stay away. And I said to one of them, you know what? If it was at the White House, I'd have gotten through the grounds to come in and see you. Mm -hmm. I just said that. Yeah. And so it Because the bottom line is, you fell off the stage, they didn't come see you, and what you wanted to know, you know, is what I always say, and I've said all these years, everybody wants to know that I matter. Yeah. Oh, you want to know that you mattered, mm -hmm. that you're falling off the stage mattered, mm -hmm. that somebody cared, that not somebody, that your bandmates cared that that happened to you. Isn't that the truth? I guess that's it. When you boil it right down to it, I wanted them to come to me and, are you all right? Yes, are you all right? But you know what I did? What? I called a band meeting and uh, I wanted my band. I wanted to tell them something I was, I'm about to tell you. What? I sat there with them. I begged for their forgiveness. I said, will you forgive me for falling off the tour stage and, and ruining the tour? Will you forgive me for that? And they said, yes. You got it. I got it. And they, and said, now, and they said, I forgive you. And after now it's been two years, now the most amazing miracles happened. We're back to the way we were back then. We're going to go back on tour and everyone's clear again. You said that being a father changed you. I thought, well, did it really? Because you continued your life as you wanted it. It felt like for many years without regard for your children. With every experience in life, there is a lesson to learn. All new, a special presentation, Oprah's Masterclass with Jane Fonda. I was on this toxic quest for perfection, and it took me a long, long time to realize we are not meant to be perfect. Oprah's bringing back the masters. I made one unforgivable mistake, and I will go to my grave with this. Oprah's Masterclass, Jane Fonda. All new next Sunday, 10, 9 central, only on OWN. Legend Steven Tyler calls his four children the loves of his life. His oldest daughter, actress Liv Tyler, was born after an affair with model B.B. Buell. Steven became a grandfather when Liv had her son, Milo. Steven married his first wife, Sarinda Fox, here at Lake Sunapee. Together, they had Mia, now a model. After nine years of marriage, Steven and Sarinda divorced. She died of a brain tumor at age 50. Steven's second marriage to Teresa Barrick lasted 17 years. They had two children, 22-year-old Chelsea and 19-year-old Taj. A few minutes ago, you mentioned you said, my wife left me. Were you a good person to be married to? I wanted the dream. I knew I could get anything as long as I could imagine it. And I saw a picket fence and... Um, a lake. A lake, the lake, just all of it. Uh, when I brought my first wife, Sarenda, here, I brought her, it was freezing cold January, I brought her in the Jeep out here to this house, the lake was frozen, pulled up like this, the lights were out, moon. Drove all the way out here and I went, okay, open your eyes. And actually her eyes were closed all the way to here and I said, close your eyes. And I turned the brights on, I said, now open them. And here was the house. And I married her, and we had Mia. Mm -hmm. And and then, um, you know, I abandoned them. Mm -hmm. I left them up here. 
In this house? Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm not the happiest person about that. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I talk to them about it a lot, and, you know, um, you know, because I really haven't forgiven myself because I'm a realist. I know what I did. Regardless whether I was on drugs a lot, people have told me, that's okay. I hear them, I get it. But a piece of me, my heart's still broken that I did that to her. Later. You know, my Angelo always says, when you know better, you do better. Did you know better when you left them here? Did you know then what you were doing? I think that's why I'm so shameful about it, because my, the me that's me that you're looking at now mm -hmm. knows better. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I know better. Mm -hmm. You know, I went out on tour. I went out on tour. And I wasn't getting along with her and mom. And stayed, and stayed on I tour. wasn't getting along with her mom. Mm -hmm. And it was this. I'm not doing it. Mm -hmm. And it was so wrong. And I once thought that thinking was so cool. Now, it's interesting. You know, yeah. It's, it's so wrong. Y you said that being a father changed you. And when I read that, I thought, well, did it really? Because you continued your life as you wanted it, as you saw it, as you chose it. It felt like for many years without regard for your children. Am I correct or not? You are. Okay. Yeah. Um, I had them, but obviously the, the, the drugs got in the way, the, yeah. the lifestyle got in the way. And then Liv, it was, yeah. was, I was with Bibi. She was my girlfriend then. I, oh, and don't get me wrong. Every one of those girls, I loved them dearly. Mm -hmm. When we made love, we cried. Mm -hmm. And after that... Oh, we that's had, good. That's good. And after that, we had a kid. Yeah. Oh, really? And it was that, when it was that heavy, yeah. there was magic. Yeah. It Your never seed happens. was planted. It never happens like that all the time. Right. Never crying. And, you know, really? as you climax. Mm -hmm. And it's something I never, I don't think I even told in the book. I never told anybody. It was just those four times. Really? Whoa, yeah. Each time you cried and, every, and, and there was then conception. We had a baby. Really? It was like, oh, something. That was something. Mm hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Get it? Okay. And the babies were born, and the, and, and and live, and and um, you know. Well, it's uh, good to be born out of that. That's a good oh, thing. Yeah. So it was love beyond, beyond and, oh love, you yeah. know. And 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 BB. But you were irresponsible. Were yeah. you not irresponsible? I was. Yeah. I was. I just hate thinking about myself like that. It hurts, right now. I get it. I see the picture. Yeah. I can own it. Yeah. It just still hurts. Yeah. And when I see Liv now and we cry and, you know, I talk about it, not as much as I did when I first got sober. Yeah. Because I said, you may never um, forgive me. Mm -hmm. I would talk like that and it was something they didn't want to hear. Forgiveness has to be earned. I, I have to earn it. Do you think you have idea. yet? Do you think you oh, have? Oh, I've been there for them. Oh, yeah. yeah, we've done this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's great. <laughs> That's good. Keep rolling. Coming up, part two. What happened when you got the call from American Idol? Steven's girlfriend. Is it possible for you to remain monogamous? And his daughter. Have you forgiven your father? Then. Into the woods with Steven Tyler. Next. Hey, yeah. I love to hear the echo. Good morning, Sonopy. Good morning. Anybody up? You might be as surprised as I was to learn that Steven Tyler, rock and roll royalty, is an early riser. This is Mia, my daughter, Aaron Darling, my significant other, and oh, how significant she is. I caught up with Stephen far, far away from the spotlight in the teeny tiny town of Sunapee, New Hampshire, where Stephen and his only sister, Linda, spent every summer of their childhood. After achieving enormous success and fame, he bought his own house on Lake Sunapee. His family still lives in the area. Good morning, Linda. My sister, Linda. Uncle Eddie. Um... Who wants eggs? Who would think Steven Tyler, lead singer of Aerosmith, star of American Idol, is just as at home in the kitchen? Good old goat milk for breakfast. You know why? Why? Because it's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all, how about a toast? A song in our hearts? Yes. And the thought of perhaps an interview with Oprah. Cheers. Okay. Let's go. Hey, you again. Want the pillow here? 
All right, so what do I do with my legs here? Yes? Mm. That double page of... Now, what happened when you got the call for American Idol? What'd you think? Last year as a judge on American Idol, he brought new life to the country's biggest television show. I think maybe you're going to Hollywood! Stephen has a unique way with words. Well, hellfire, save matches, f a duck, and see what hatches. What? A huge heart. I just heard your fiancé sing, and he's so good. That's, that's why he sings so good, because he sings to you. And at 63, can still flirt with the best of them. Sexy. Where is your pitchfork, you little devil? The long-running show earned its best ratings in years. I actually put it out there right before, what I was getting at just before was the nine years of me get, of spinning out again after having 12 years sober. Mm -hmm. My girlfriend, one morning, Erin, she Aaron. goes, you're going to Betty Ford. I went, F you. And I went into the bathroom at Liv's house and I crushed something up and snorted it. And I came out and said, how dare you? You need it more than I did. <laughs> Two days later, I called my best friend, Frank Angie, who had a plane and he flew me out to Betty Ford. And I got a chance with a, I got a chance to, at 62 years old, stop and go, clean me, start from bottom to end. So she said you're going to Betty Ford, and then American Idol, you get the call. Well, I, before I went there, I would say to my manager, I said, I don't care, get me something to do. If I'm going in there, when I come out, I want you know, something. So you had said to your manager, find me something, and the manager came up with American yeah. Idol? Uh, no, Actually, no, no. you got the call I said, from... I said, get me American Idol or something. I'd been talking to Marty Fredrickson, who I write songs with, and he was writing songs with Kira, who was uh, one of the uh, judges on there. So we went and wrote a song as soon as I got out of there, and, uh, and they said, you got to do American Idol. You'd be a perfect judge for it. So unbeknownst to me, they were already, already looking. Is it true that when Kira called, you said, is it still getting good ratings? I did. I got the text I can show you. <laughs> I saved it. She said, I said text, yeah. how are the ratings? And I also thought, am I going to take over for this grunch, this grinch, I mean, this grump, who oh, likes me, to me. put people down the you last thing? You mean Simon? Thing? The last thing I heard Simon say was, I don't like you, and I don't like country western. I thought, how dare you? That's not what music's about, not liking a genre. Mm -hmm. That's really not nice. So, you were worried about replacing Simon or not worried? I thought maybe they might like that. They might have liked someone who went, you know, you suck, get out of here. Mm -hmm. And they might be used to that particular character in the show. And then I thought, you know, uh, there's something about my character that I like a lot. Mm -hmm. There's something about me that's enamoring. I've, so, I've seen how I can change people with mm -hmm. just sitting with them. I like that. I took a chance. A late night dance with the missing who was ready to play. Was it me? She was fooling when she told me she was doing. She told me how to walk this way. She told me to walk this way. <laughs> I just always thought I could, and I went, I'm going to take a chance and see if, you know, compassion and love and, and, and playfulness and maybe fun, you know, yeah. not too stupid, but, yeah. you know, <laughs> oh, but, you know, could be the new, the new black. <laughs> the last time yeah. I interviewed Simon, he was saying that he was running out of things to say. Oh. Well, you've only been doing it one season, but sometimes when people come up and they are really, really bad, mm. so bad that those of us at home think, God, is this a plant that yeah. this person's is bad? Yeah. Are you thinking, yeah, what am I going to say? I have taken a few things and kept putting them in my top pocket, like, you know, um, one of them was great. So my friend Mark Hudson said, uh, um, uh, did you eat a lot of paint chips as a child? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and did you bump your head on the way in here? And I use them quite frequently, and, but they use it. I can't go there again, so i gotta right, think, right. I got to think some things up. Mm -hmm. Because believe me, some of them come in there dressed like a car and go, did the end? I go, you don't really think you can sing? And they'll look and go, what? That's when my heart breaks. What? My grandfather told me I could sing. Mom told me I can sing, and I've been watching Idol for the last 10 years. Are you saying I can't sing? And now I go, oh, oh. oops. Oh, you were serious. Oh, yeah. I, you, you came in here, and you were serious. Yeah. yeah. It's just hard for me. Yeah. That's, I'm just, Is it hard for you to hurt people's feelings? Yeah, that's what I mean. Mm -hmm. I'm so codependent. Now, if I was this close to them, like you and I, mm -hmm. I'd say, you didn't really come in here to try to fool us, did you? I could do it, but they're far away, and I'm sitting next to J-Lo. Mm. Alpha, yes. you know, mm. female, mm -hmm. Twella Eternus herself, <laughs> and, and, and Randy, I'll say something, I'll go, wow. you know, I, I'll get flavlungered with my lips, I just, uh, you know, I think, um, you know, you just, you really didn't hit the notes uh, kind of so good, and Randy will go, really? <laughs>
<laughs> really, Stephen? <laughs> and then I get, oh, God. It's so when Rolling Stone said that you brought Idol back, yeah. that great review about you bringing Idol back, yeah. how did you feel? I felt so good. You got to know that I didn't ever, why would I do Idol? Yeah. I came from the era where um, you had to play clubs. You had to show your worth by dancing and playing every night. And if you didn't fall down and learn how to get back up, and then fall down and get back up, you got intestinal fortitude. Right. I'm not coming on Idol and singing the first time, and if I'm okay, then I win. Half these kids that we sent home aren't, were, are twice as good as Janis Joplin was when she first sang her first note, or I was. I look at these kids and I go, oh my God, I really sucked. <laughs> I would have gotten thrown off the show. And all these kids need is two or three years of clubs and they could be as good as anyone out there. So do you feel that for a lot of these kids who are coming through that, you know, more experience, more time, more work would make a difference? Sure. I'm letting kids go. And I see a glimmer in all of them. But we're looking for the American Idol and I have to say to them, I have to say to them, you know, uh, this is American Idol. You're going to have to go up in front of millions of people, and America's going to vote on you. I've got to tell you right now, you're going to have to go back. But here's the good news. Work on it for another year. Don't be, you see, I don't want to tell anybody they suck and can't sing simply because. Even when they really can't. Yeah, and I'll tell you why. Even when they really can't. I'll tell you why. How many children have been sang to by mothers when they're three years old yeah. Yeah. that can't sing, but they gave, they went, you are the yeah. angel of my life. Mm -hmm. And they're singing to the baby as it's breastfeeding. I don't want someone to tell someone there they can't sing and they go home and now they'll but never you, sing to their but, baby. But you know this more than anybody. Yeah. You know what kind of energy you have to put out to get 30,000 people to be right there with you. To have an audience of millions of people around the country watching to be right there with you. And, you know, you've done that to the point of, you know, breaking your feet and losing your voice and all of that other. The kind of, what it, that it thing that it takes to be able to not just sing, mm -hmm. but to be able to hold that audience. Mm -hmm. Are you also looking for that? I am. That glimmer of, that certain something that I know not what. Because you can't really put your finger on it. But, you know, we'll find them. Because as good as Randy is in his music, as good as J-Lo is, and as good as I am, that's what we're going to spot it. You got it. What did it do for you when you realized that all these years, you've been performing 40 years mm -hmm. on stage, thousands of people, fans, mm -hmm. and now middle America, grandmothers, grandfathers, 7-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 18-year-olds, the world has embraced you? Um... Lots of nights when I was alone in the house on, up there on Laurel Canyon, mm -hmm. I thought to myself, I knew it. I knew it. Really? I had some sort of magic that, in the band in the beginning, that was kept under wraps. Bands, this band in particular, we were treated like mushroom farmers. We were kept in the dark and covered with bullshit. Oh, really? Now I'm doing idle. And I'm, I'm hitting that middle America, and I, it's just made me think that I had something else a little bit more than resonated other than the dark side and rock and roll. Is it hard to read about yourself in your daughter's book? Okay, Steven Tyler's taking me to his magical space. Yep, let's bring me in. Keep rolling, Mia, come in. Just, you know, why did I wind up in rehab? Why? Look at your toe. That's Look. why. <gasps> oh my goodness. That's what I got for feet. That's from doing this on stage. It's from, from this, you know, from that. It's just they're, they're gone. Wow. And it's, I know, right? That's what I have to deal with. At least I got and one that, good is toe. Is that painful? Yeah, way. Way, way. Big. Oh my gosh. Uh, Way. Big. It's and that's from what? Pushing your foot down on stage? Yeah, yep, 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 yep. Over and over and over trauma. 40 years trauma. Oh, by the way, you guys aren't getting this. <laughs> Look at that. The people passing oh, by. Oh, no, every time they pass your house to people's Every street. time. The guy rings the bell and he goes, that's the house on you. Steven Tyler Royer. <laughs> oh, I went down the hall and went, don't ever do that again, please. 
Wow. Yeah, okay. he stopped about two, three years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Mia, where are you? Mia, Mia are you here? Oh. Give me a hi. Give me a hug, girl. Mm -hmm. Hi, girl. How are you? Real hug. Real hug. Come on. Stephen's daughter, Mia Tyler, wrote a memoir in 2008 called Creating Myself. Mia wrote candidly about growing up in the shadow of an unhappy marriage between Stephen and his ex-wife, Sarinda Fox. Her father was rarely around. Both her parents struggled with drug addiction, and so did Mia. Sarinda Fox died in 2002 of a brain tumor. Today, Stephen and Mia, both sober, are rebuilding their relationship. Quiet, please. Quiet on the set. And that means you. I will shut up. Watch. So... What's it like? Hi, Mia. Hi. <laughs> uh, I think a lot of people would think certainly living uh, in a house where your dad's a rock star would be the coolest, uh, most fun thing. It is, is. Is it? It is. I mean, our lifestyle is a little different. We're very earthy. We're very spiritual. Mm -hmm. We've got, um, I mean, as you can see, there's a lot of things hanging mm -hmm. and very playful. Dad's always been a big kid, so being a child with a child dad is yeah. cool you get to have slides in your house <laughs> that's really a better question what's it like living with a d with a dad who never really grew up i mean it's bittersweet nice. it's, it's beautiful <laughs> <laughs> it's fun because you get to have fun and and i mean you know we've got doors open for us that most people don't mm -hmm. the other side of that is is you know i i grew up with my mom i grew up with my mom in this house mm -hmm. and so i had her side of things and then his playful side whenever he would come to town and mm -hmm. so it was a good it was a good mix but um i think the one thing that everyone always thinks is that we're very like spoiled typical kids of a rock star and we're mm -hmm. so we're very down to earth and very kind of hippie like and as much as we have been given a lot we're not super privileged we appreciate everything we have when you were growing up though did you think you had a normal dad did you, did you, did you resent not having a normal dad? Because uh, I know you knew you didn't have a normal right. dad. Right. No, I mean, I, I think he's beautiful. His spirit is beautiful. I knew at a young age that he was different. Um, the only thing that I didn't like was the way he dressed. I used to tell him I wanted him to dress like Robert Palmer, wear suits, and I didn't get the whole capes and the androgynous mm -hmm. thing. I mean, I was a kid. I didn't, uh -huh. didn't want to see dad doing that kind of stuff. Uh -huh. So I think that was the only thing I didn't like. She'd always say, Dad, you're not wearing that, are you? <laughs> I still do that. <laughs> but when you wrote your book, um, you, you said some things in the book about growing up with, you know, this kind of lifestyle that I thought were really pretty candid about what it really means to live in the space where all the attention is going to your, mm -hmm. your parents. Can you talk a bit about that? Um, yeah, I mean, we grew up in the shadows. Um, we are given things and it's beautiful and we take advantage of that but then there's the other side of it where everyone wants his attention and then you kind of feel pushed aside a little bit but the older you get the more you kind of uh, get out of that but I, I think it's it's, it's when different. you wrote the book were you angrier you seem calmer now um, it was probably two of the hardest years of my life because mm -hmm. I had to go and relive a lot of my demons and I didn't want to write a book that was just you know poor me poor me poor me mm -hmm. negative negative I wanted to write a book so that every story I said that was sad or negative there was the flip to that the positive way that I got through that mm -hmm. so um, yeah it was the best therapy but it was also the hardest thing I've ever done did it help you to create yourself absolutely yeah, oh, the, yeah. the process of actually writing the oh book. yeah is it hard to read about yourself in your daughter's book very very from her perspective, what did you yeah. learn about yourself? That I heard her be far worse than I thought I did. I mean, it, it, you know, and it just it killed something inside of me. Mm -hmm. Was reading her book one of the first times you realized how, how deep that was for her? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm still like, you know, it's just not easy, you know, mm -hmm. abandoning a child. It's just the worst thing. It's the worst thing. Did you feel abandoned, Mia? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we all do in a in a sense. What well, we all? What do you mean by that? All us kids. All oh, you kids. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I know now that his career is the way it is because mm -hmm. you put your career first, and I think that's a beautiful thing. And I'm okay. I've made peace 
with not having I mean I grew up with my mom but she still wasn't there either but I made peace with not having them there to like guide me and teach me everything and I learned stuff on my own but I mean there's there's definitely an abandoned sense um, we all kind of feel it afraid things are gonna get taken away and not come back I mean I, I it's it's crazy being in this house now with you here and all these people here because I, I I remember you would come to visit me for Christmas and bring all these beautiful presents and my mom was so crazy and I just I was get so excited that you would come here and then you would leave and I, I thought that if I cried really hard like that where you're just like you can't even breathe that somehow that would bring you back and I would always pray that like your tire would pop or something that he'd have to come back and it's so it's 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 nice to have new feelings and emotions in this house because mm -hmm. for a long time this house just reminded me of a lot of negative stuff because mm -hmm. yeah. what you're describing and what you described in the book even though you were angry is that you longed for him oh yeah you had a longing for him mm -hmm. yeah well he was so cool I mm -hmm. mean he dressed cool he always brought presents he was always like the sunshine when I lived with my mom and, and her energy was just really dark mm -hmm. for a long time and so I was so excited when you would come because it would bring such a different emotion to this house and it was definitely um, it was a strange childhood but I mean I'm okay with it I my you made peace with it I made peace because I I watched my mom grow up and she was so negative and she held so much in and mm -hmm. she she was still angry with him she was so angry mm -hmm. um, and then she got brain cancer and there's no real reason why you get that and I in my heart of hearts I believe that she bottled so much up and kept so much in not just with dad but with her whole life that mm -hmm. something just popped in there and created this negative mass mm -hmm. in her brain and I just I swore that I would never be like that have you forgiven your father for not being there is it hard keeping up with a guy who lives on the tail of a comet given your father I have I mean I get mad at him sometimes when he gets mad at me and I'm like you have no right to be mad have at me you, but have you forgiven your father for not being there yeah. have you forgiven your father oh, yeah. for the of course yeah I mean I can't hold on to that and he's given me so much that he's here now and we don't always understand each other but that's typical and mm -hmm. I mean it, when he gets mad at me it's like the worst thing in the world for me because I just don't know how to handle that but then once I get over it why don't you know how to handle it because you think you're gonna be abandoned again probably mm -hmm. you think he's gonna leave and not come back yeah mm -hmm. but I just I'm not playing doctor no Fulman no it's anything, great no yeah. it's good that, <laughs> I'm not going down the line, hearing that stuff is great it helps me move on so mm -hmm. that's great but um, after I've healed from it you know a couple weeks later I'm like oh nice dad just got mad at me for something because I didn't really have that as a kid or like t even recently he was like where are you going out when are you coming back be home early you know and it's like well I'm almost 33 let me think about <laughs> that but I love it you know I do love it at the end of the day and so what was it like seeing him I, I, first of all to see your father on stage performing what is that like um it was just so normal to me I grew up I mean I think it was uh, not even a year old the first time I went to see him so it was just that was such a normal thing for me um, love it my favorite times is when we're in like Alabama you know no one else is there there's no managers no suits no nobody no other family members and it's just him and I and I'll sit in the front in the barricade and he'll just like talk to me during the show or like hand me his my his his whatever when he's done with it or mm -hmm. we just have this like connection and it's nice because it's like you're in an arena with 25 30,000 people and it's just like the two of us and I love that feeling I love that I love that that's like a, a bond that no one else can have and I just it makes me feel special when you saw my American Idol for the first time what'd you think oh my god we were so nervous because sometimes things aren't taken seriously and and to us he's such a an amazing voice and such a rock legend that we didn't want to see that get 
marginalized, marginalized. Yes. Yeah. And so the first episode, um, we were just kind of clenching in our chairs, but his personality comes out perfectly. I mean, the way he talks to people and his silly little, mm -hmm. even the sex jokes, it's like, it's so right on. And then... Yeah. Oh, yes. Wow. Oh, Impressive. Steven. Ooh, please. <laughs> Someone will come out and he'll, his heart will just open up and, and you can see that and that's how he is. And so we instantly, we were like, okay, this is going to be good. And it's fun for you. I mean, it opens him up to a whole new generation mm -hmm. and he loves being in the spotlight. And what better chance than to be on American Idol? And I was so concerned because I'm not sure if you wanted me to do it. No, we didn't at first. And we I knew so that. so anti that. And so I got this text. I still have it. I saved it. And it says, Dad, or the, I have your voicemail. Dad, you were so great last night. I can't believe it. All my friends. It was like, yes. <laughs> Thank you, God. That was it. Not the New York Times or... Rolling Stone. No. That was, was good, though. Hearing them say that, wow. And there you have it. And there you have it. That's all we need. <laughs> yeah. That's all we need. That was great, oh, Mia. So great. That was so good. <laughs> that was so good. <laughs> I just want to call you and tell you um, I'm on my way home, um, and that's that, and I'm alive, and I love you, and you're awesome on that, and I can't wait to watch you tonight. Bye. Am I good enough for American Idol? I'm gonna walk you tonight. Is that good? Is that good? Am I going to Hollywood? You're going to Hollywood! Is it possible to remain monogamous and be a rock star? Stephen met his longtime girlfriend, Erin Brady, while on the road with Errol Smith. She was the band's tour accountant. Background clear. Erin? Hi, hi, Erin. Yes. Oh, yeah. I know, it's chilly. Yes. So Stephen says he lives on the tail of a comet. Is it hard keeping up with a guy who lives on the tail of a comet? It is. Sometimes it is, because he's a little bit older than I am. And uh, I'm surprised sometimes at how much energy he has, and I don't. <laughs> Really? Yeah. It yeah. seems in the morning, it seems like I mean, it's just, boundless. It seems yeah. like it's boundless, right? It never ends. Ever. Energize a bunny. Mm -hmm. Really? Uh-huh. You know what is interesting? Uh, in his book, he talks about, I, I can't remember which w wife it was. I think it was Mia's mom, about being upset that you were on the road and that you had affairs, that you were not monogamous, and you were saying, well, you were sorry that you hurt her, but what do you think a rock star is doing out there when beat women are throwing their panties on stage and throwing their lipstick on stage? I know. Yeah, you know that. I really like it when they fit me and the lipstick looks good on my skin. <laughs> <laughs> but, and they're waiting and they're willing to do whatever is necessary mm -hmm. to be able to sleep with your man. How do, you, how do you deal with that? It's, it is very hard sometimes, but and since the beginning of our relationship, we both had a pretty good understanding mm -hmm. of, of the opportunity been, that's out there. How long have you been there. together now? Seven years. Seven years, mm -hmm. Yeah, because I was on the road for a long time, too. So With I, him? I actually used to pay him. Yes. Yes, mm -hmm. so um, I saw him. I watched the... him. Mm -hmm. I saw how, how he behaved mm -hmm. badly occasionally here and there. But, um, but I just said, hey, listen, if you play, I'm going to play. I just want to make that clear to you. And, and he... Didn't really like it, I think, when he was on the other side of that scenario. Ooh. So, so you said, if you're going to play, I'm going to play. Mm -hmm. Out loud, you said that. I said that. I used different words, but yes, yes. I didn't say that out loud. <laughs> and what was your reaction to that, Mr. Tyler? Oh, I was, you know, uh, I, I think I heard it and took it. You know, it was funny at first, but if you think about it, you know, you see, that's the thing about, you know, being sober now is playing things through. Mm -hmm. I'd love to do her, mm -hmm. since she's going like this and backstage. But, but what happens if I get caught and then, you know, and she's with somebody? Mm -hmm. uh, it, and uh, it's just, it's, it, it's, it's, I think it's a little easier for a relationship when it's played like a game like that, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to don't break the rules. I think I was a little, I was a little taken back by that particular wife, um, you know, uh, 
only because some other people in my life, higher ups, had said, doesn't she know who you are? And I had the audacity to think, yeah, doesn't she know I'm a rock star and, I'm, and these people are throwing themselves at me? It's wrong doing that, especially if you can take a vow being married. But there's also something else in that vow that's missing. Whatever happened to, for better or worse, or till, till, till death do us part? Yeah. And so... But you're not trying to justify <clears throat> fooling around. No, no, no. Time. I'm certainly not. Yeah. I'm certainly not. Like yeah. And, uh, <laughs> but you're not trying to justify fooling around. But this, no. is a, this is a question, and it's a hard question to answer in front of Aaron, and I know that. Mm -hmm. but so I'm watching. Lay it on me, Okay. Man. Is it possible to remain monogamous and be a rock star? Yes. Is it possible for you to remain monogamous? Yes, it is. You know what's going on right now is that I don't want to hurt anybody again. Okay. For all the divorces I've had, I hurt those girls deeply. Mm -hmm. And it was, there was some behavior that I'm ashamed of and I shouldn't have done. Yeah, and I saw you on the cover of People magazine, mm -hmm. and the quote, the pull quote was that you didn't want to be a role model for bad behavior, right? You I don't. don't. Yeah. I, I just can't. It's, I don't want to hurt another human being. I just don't want to hurt so another human being. So when you were fooling around all those years, not being monogamous, did you, you, did you not realize you were hurting your no. wife? Because it, was, uh, because it was of the moment, and it was too hot. It gets hot out there. There could be two girls making out in the front row that are penthouse centerfolds, and it's like, wait, what? And then they're backstage, and you ask yourself, I'm not going to die and not have, to, and not have tried that. Uh -huh. I had those thoughts. Uh -huh. I cannot imagine what it would be like to make love to that. Uh -huh. Every man has had those thoughts. The ones that haven't are the ones that are still, you know, in relationships. So how do you, do, do you travel with him? Do you feel like you need to be with him on tour? Yeah. <laughs> you do? Really? Uh -huh. Yeah, I do. I mean, I'm not stupid. <laughs> no, but Aaron, I mean, there has to be a level of trust because... There is a level of trust. There because is you can't be with him all the time. I can't be with him all the time. In the beginning, I definitely tried. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's not fun either. But also, obviously, you know this about him because I sensed it from television all these years and just being in his presence, he has a huge sexual thing going. It does. A it huge really sexual aura. Uh-huh. I mean, there's a charmness and charming and, and sweet, but there's a huge sexual vibe thing. it out thing. there. Yeah, it's out there. Yeah, it's out there for everyone. My mm -hmm. mother, my sister, someone mm -hmm. I don't know, it's always there. Mm -hmm. and, and I hope for the best. I mean, don't get me wrong. There's times when I am not with him and I worry for no reason. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I haven't heard from him today, even though I know he's busy. But mm -hmm. it's like hiding someone's pills or no, digging through their, their phone. Mm -hmm. I don't want to live like that. You don't want to live like I, that. Uh, and I can't do it. So what is the key to your relationship? When he says um, there's two beautiful women in the front row, mm -hmm. I understand what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. And he, so he can openly say that to me mm -hmm. all day long. And sometimes okay. he does say that to me all day long. <laughs> <laughs> but okay. just getting it out there, it's not a big secret, and then we move on. Okay, so are you, are you the kind of woman who could say, well... He could have sex with those two women in the front row, but eventually he's coming home to me, and so that's okay. Mm. I w no, that would hurt me. That would hurt you? Mm-hmm. Okay. I wouldn't like that. Mm -hmm. I might say it. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'd mean it. So you are in this relationship, and you want a monogamous, full-time relationship. Yes. Mm -hmm. That is your expectation? Yes. Well, the same here. I want her for myself. Not only that, but, you know, as you said, it's a wonder I'm not dead. Um, it's a wonder I don't have AIDS from what I've done. I may come off as a sexual animal, and I definitely am on stage, because trust me, I feel it myself. Mm -hmm. But I'm not 24-7. I'm not really, really that. I'll sing about it. I put it out there, but I'm not. Could I be? Could be. I never have been. I've never gone on a spree of... A stupping spree. I'd like to do that. I'd like to go on a stupping spree and screw every girl I see that would want to have me. Who wouldn't? But I don't. But you don't. I don't. I want it for my own, and if that's going to take that away from it, I don't. What makes this relationship work? Um, me apologizing, wouldn't you, wouldn't you say? <laughs> You're a good apologizer. Yeah, yeah lately, but it's think, like enough. For me, I think it's we work together, and we live together, and we sleep together, and I can understand for a wife of a, someone who has a career that they... It's like a different language to them when they're on the phone. They don't know what they're talking about. They don't care. Mm -hmm. They're annoyed. But because you were on yes. the road with the band, paying because the he bill. eats it, he breathes it, he lives it. It's everything to him. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how it would work if 
if I felt differently. Do you feel that music is the first love? I do. And that you come where and there? I think I'm, I'm up there with it. I don't feel like I'm less than, but I, I know I know who he is. Mm -hmm. It's just a big part of him. It's like breathing for him. But I love that about him. What's the loveliest, kindest, sweetest, open your heart thing he ever did for you? For me? Mm -hmm. oh. So sweet. Um, he, he went all the way to Alaska to visit my grandmother, who I loved more than anything, he passed away a few years ago. And he was on tour, and he took four days to come up to Alaska and meet her, because we knew she wasn't going to be around for long. And he did that for me. And I'll never forget that. There you go. I love that. I wasn't expecting that answer. <laughs> I love that it was that and not, he bought me a... Yeah. He got me a Harley. <laughs> he bought me a Harley. <laughs> That's great, guys. All right, let's get to the hill. All right, that was great. That was great. That was good stuff. Loveliest, sweetest, that was good stuff. Bye. Stephen told me there's a magic here at Lake Sunapee where he spent every summer growing up. It's also where he met the legendary Joe Perry, Aerosmith's lead guitar player. Before I left Sunapee, oh, Stephen God. took me on a drive in his vintage Ford Phaeton to the spot where he says his spirit was born. Oh, Stephen and his sister Linda sent me off with a song. Like and when you're leaving Sunapee, I tell you what we'll do. We'll sit right down in the middle of the road and bring folks sing, sing your best. In Sunapee, there is rest, no rest. Bye. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, is that the Sunapee song? Yeah. When the guests left. Oh. You know, people that we spent a week with in there. Oh. I sang with the little kids and... You know, when you get to, in a week, you can so get to yes, love somebody. Yes. And when they left, we all went out and we took pots and pens, the whole family, six, seven, eight, nine, ten of us, and Sing banged pots the... and pens. Oh. Like this. As they were leaving, and everybody cried. We cried if we, you know. Wow. Because you got to know the people and then they're gone. Mm hmm. Wow. Yep. Bye. 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 See ya. Everybody's so darn friendly. I know. There's the harbor. <laughs> there is the harbor. Yeah. Doesn't this look like a set on the a yeah, Fox lot? Absolutely. It's just I'm so glad you could come up and see yeah, this. Yeah, if you were to create a little town, mm -hmm. it's like something out of a lot. There's the police, and there's the harborside trading, and the Wild Goose Country Store. And the place that I met Joe Perry, the Anchorage. That's it? That's it. That's where I met Joe Perry. Uh, well, I mean, he was making french fries. Yeah, I thought he pulled up in your yard and you just finished doing the lawn. Oh, I'll show you the pl where he pulled okay. in. Okay, okay. That's a gorgeous house. Mm. I love a house with a porch and some rocking yes. chairs. Yes. Love that house. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and this is Trow Rico here. That's the lawn right there I was mowing. Oh! That's, that's Trow Rico. Oh. That's the place I grew up. Wow. I'm mowing the lawn, Joe pulls up in his little MG. And he said, I'm playing up here at the barn. It's just an old barn where the band used to play. And you heard him play, and you knew you found your soulmate. Yeah. yeah. He had black hair. He was good looking. Um, he didn't give a, two craps about anything. Just what I loved. Yeah. He really, he really didn't care. And you've been brothers ever since? Yeah. Off and on, Off fighting and on. the way brothers do, and all and, that other stuff. Oh, uh, yeah, completely fighting, completely out of each other's life. He was actually looking for him. He got pissed off at me. They were angry at me for taking Idol. So when I got sober, right, I came in and went, why are you angry? It did nothing but bring up Aerosmith sales 260%. You stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, uh, it's because you didn't tell me. I said, I didn't tell you because it was the biggest secret on the planet, whether J-Lo was doing it and who was, yep. and it was very secret. And I didn't tell the band. But do you now think you should have told them just like, just before it was announced, you should have said, by the way, yeah, you're I gonna hear this announcement. Of course. Yeah, you're gonna of hear this. That's what I think. 
but yeah. they got over it, right? Right, yes. You are so nice. No, You're a you magical so child. Nice. No, no, you are. Spot, I can, I can tell. And I'm so lonely in life. I have no friends like you. I'm alone. I'm alone. Well, now you're not. I know, I know. Because now we will be friends. I, I, I know, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah. How rare do you meet somebody you can talk to that gets it? I mean, you get it so... You no, so I, get I it. I really get it. Oh, God. How really many good. thousands of people you've talked to in long uh, HD, high-definition <laughs> understanding. <laughs> Got it. Beautiful. So we're going into the woods. Yeah, we're, we're down this path. Okay, I love it. Who would have thought you are nature boy? Who would have thought that? This makes me so happy to be in here. And in the woods with you? It makes me so happy to be in the woods. How do you feel coming into the woods? Does it feel like coming back home for you? Yeah, I mean, this is where I found my spirituality. And what do you mean by spirituality? When I use the word, people get all thrown by it. Okay. So what, what do you mean? Okay, so in the silence, I heard something and I was first scared by it. Uh -huh. And then, like, like back in there, it was so quiet. Uh -huh. And I was so alone back now. In there? Yeah, I'd go into the thick of the woods. Really? And I heard silence. And this is a place where I was walking back in here once. So let's go in this way. Okay. Okay. Wow. Well, you know, we'll go in here. Uh-huh. Um, this may be a Ooh, little hard I, for you. This is what I love. This is what I love. This is beauty to me. Okay. A moss-covered... Look at yeah. this. It's Come gorgeous. on. Okay. It's not too far. Okay. It's just a little bit. Into the woods. Mm -hmm. With Steven Tyler. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Oh my into God. the woods. Who would have thought you are nature boy? Who would have yeah. thought that? This was it. This is this is me. I would I would look down here for salamanders and think, why is this a little gully? And and what's over here? And and oh my God, it's got to be something living. Would in you there. spend? Would your parents let you spend time out here alone? Oh yeah. I never came back. I mowed the lawns, and I just did this. Wow. Listen. It's the stillness. Yeah, it's the stillness. It's the stillness. It's the stillness. Yeah. There is. There it is. the magic. There it is. Yeah, come back there home it is. here. Okay. I want to show you this. Okay. Right, look. Steven Tyler's taking me to his magical space. Look at this. Look. Oh my God. Look right? At this. Yeah. And it's, it's a bed. just. It's a what, bed. what doesn't live down in here? Yeah. Right? Yeah. And this is where. And I would sit in here and, you know, today I'd say the Lord's Prayer, of course. Mm -hmm. Then I just thought these wild thoughts of, of what? What's really living in under all the fairy tale books you see? Look, there's a whole city in there. Mm -hmm. Full. There's a whole village right here. Yeah. We're sitting in somebody's village. Yep. With a sleeping bag laid down on this, it's as soft oh as soft God. can and be. It smells. What you can't do is. Yes. That was the thing that you said uh, in your book that drugs take away from you is are the smells, right? You, mm -hmm. you, you're, you're numbed out and you can't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, if you were on drugs right now, you wouldn't be able to sense this the same way. No, absolutely no. not. Really? Mm hmm This is pretty special. Yeah. To be in a moment with all this stuff is... Oh, my God, right there. Mm -hmm. I told you this morning on the... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you think that this is where you came to know yourself? I think I put together... You know, the beauty of Mother Nature and music, and somewhere in that, I felt a presence of God. In the music, I thought that, that God was there. In the music. You know what? I think God's not just in the music. I think God is the music. Mm. 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 <laughs> I'm going to do my Stephen look. Mm. <laughs> I think God is mm -hmm. the music. That's the closest I've got. Yeah. Mm. All right, this was great. Yeah. Really great good. Job, yep, yep. I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. You got to look out over here. This was a fun day. 
Got a fern bouquet. Yay! That's a wrap. This was a fun day.